One of the things I, I love so much that I get to do is I get to travel the world and I have the privilege of going to so many places and, and to meet such extraordinary people. And this trip has been no different to go to KL and to Taipei and to Singapore and to interact with both entrepreneurs and, and people of tremendous faith to meet with cultural pioneers and inventors and innovators. And, and, and you get to meet people who do what they do better than anybody in the world. And it begins to, to create in, inside of your own experience a sense of, of the extraordinary capacity inside of every human being. Sometimes it feels like people who accomplish something great are just different material, doesn't it? They're just different material than the rest of us. We're, we're made of ordinary material, and they're made of some other kind of source or substance. And yet one of the unique things about Mosaic is that we have a conviction that there is greatness inside of every human being. And I hope you never get tired of hearing this because this is going to be the story we tell with every breath we have. That there has never been an ordinary human being created on this planet. That there is greatness inside of you. And I, I, I found that sometimes it's actually people of faith who resist this perspective on humanity most. They'll say, no, no, it's God that's great. We're not great. We're just humans. And in fact, they seem almost a little bit nervous that if you focus on the greatness of people, that you're not focusing on the greatness of God. You're almost diminishing his greatness. And I want you to understand something, that, that I'm absolutely convinced that God is great. And you probably would expect to hear in this kind of environment that God is great, but maybe you're a little surprised that someone would tell you that you're great. Or at least that you have greatness within you. But then it makes perfect sense to me. Because you see, if God is great, then everything he creates is great. Because if you're great, you can't create something that's just okay. And if God is great and he created you in his image, in his image and likeness, then he created you with greatness within you. And if that's so, then God's not worried about your greatness because your greatness is just a reflection of his greatness. So he's not worried about you being great. God's not up there going, oh no, they're going to be too great. In fact, they're so great, they're diminishing my greatness because you're great, but you're not that great. You're not so great that you can actually diminish the greatness of God. But in, in fact, when you live beneath the greatness that God has placed in you, you diminish the image of God. You do not properly reflect who he is and who he created you to be. But I, I think there's this dilemma, though, because we have this absolute conviction that every human being has greatness within them, but the reality is that very few people ever actually live out that greatness. Most of us will live our lives being haunted by a greatness we have never achieved or attained or accessed within us. In fact, I'm convinced there's some of you here right now that, that have this sense that there's more in you than you can access, that there's something beautiful, something extraordinary. Yes, even greatness inside of you, but somehow it's elusive to you. And so you've lived a life that's less than the life you're created to live. How is it possible that God could create us with greatness within us, and yet we could live a life beneath that greatness? I think sometimes it's, it's because of the implications of our language of faith. We talk about things like grace and faith, and it oftentimes makes us passive about life. You know, God will do it. You know, if it's supposed to happen, it'll happen. Have you ever had people tell you that? Have you ever said that yourself? You know, if it's meant to be, it'll be. I hear so much passive garbage from people of faith <laughs> that justifies our own apathy, mediocrity, and inability to access the greatness within us. So you know what I've noticed? is that the people who say, you know, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. It seems like God never wants anything to happen for them. <laughs> but the person who steps into their intention and takes responsibility, takes ownership for the greatness within them, it's amazing how often God shows up for them. So I want to take some time and talk about what it takes to be great. Because I don't want you to live in this elusive mirage 
that if there's greatness in you, it just naturally happens. It just naturally emerges because you're just so awesome. You're so great. It just can't help but being great. But speaking of that, have you ever had like a moment where you were like awesome? <laughs> you know? I mean, you can't say that out loud, although in LA, we do. <laughs> you ever had that moment you thought, wow, that was kind of great. I hope they saw it. <laughs> and, and maybe you can't sustain it. It was just five minutes of greatness. If only you could get it on film. And it could almost be in any arena of life. Have you ever had like, maybe you're an actor and you're like, I had that moment. I was so, I was so tender. <laughs> I was so in touch with my deepest self. Have you ever had that moment? I was like Daniel Day-Lewis, it was amazing. But you couldn't sustain it. And you know, they say that even about like professional quarterbacks that are backups. They're professional backups because they can have moments of greatness, but they can't sustain it. They have one or two games that are, games that are spectacular. Even the question right now about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with Fitzpatrick, he's playing the greatest football possible. But can he sustain it? Because his history is he starts great and then he fades away. Because it's so hard to sustain greatness. Have you ever had a moment where you just, you're just great? Maybe somebody asked you for advice and you're not really that good at giving advice, but you had a moment. You were, you were like Yoda. You, just, you had the insight. It worked. And, it, and they did what you said it, and it was the right thing. And, but you, you couldn't sustain it because you're just not that wise. And, and you, <laughs> so after that, you just said, you know, you need to figure this out for yourself. I can't be that for you. You ever had that moment where maybe at work you were the best employee? Just for a few moments, just for five minutes, you were a great employee. If only your boss saw it. Some of you, you thought you were going to be professional athletes because you had your five minutes of greatness. I was so great, but I couldn't sustain it. See, the reality is that most of us have moments of greatness in our life. Sometimes you have like relational genius. Inside of you. you ever, did you ever date someone and, and you almost had the fight, but you were just so smooth? Like you were a genius, a relational genius. You avoided the conflict and she stopped being mad at you. But you couldn't sustain it. <laughs> and that's why the relationship is over. Because <laughs> you couldn't sustain those moments of greatness. See, I think a lot of us, at times, we have illusions of who we're going to be by those, those, those little flashes of greatness. I almost was a great musician. But then the sixth minute came. Almost a great athlete, but then 10 minutes happened. Almost was great. But what does it take to be great? I started thinking about different people who are great. And, and it's interesting because the people in the scriptures, we would identify them as great. Moses was great, and Esther was great, and Ruth was great, and Daniel was great. And, and we see these men and women who achieve a level of greatness. And, and sometimes we, we want to extract just a moment in their life and, and try to make that our life. But, but there are moments you study the trees, but other moments you need to study the forest. See, there are moments you have to look at the overarching pattern in people's lives and ask the question, is there, is, is there a consistent pattern that we can see over and over again in people, both in the scriptures and in history, who attain greatness that maybe we need to take on in our life? So I thought about one person that I think is clearly the greatest person of our time in their particular field. I almost hate to admit this, but I love Steph Curry, and, and I love Kevin Durant, and I love everyone on the Warriors team, and, and I hope the Clippers are great this year. But I'm just going to have to say, if an objective analysis of professional basketball, that the greatest player, the most dominant player alive today is LeBron James. And... I'm not saying that because I want to say it. I'm saying it because I think it's true. <laughs> and, and, and it's not even whether you like his approach toward the game or, or, or the teams that he's on. I know now Laker fans are going crazy because LeBron is a Laker. and Now the Lakers are going to be great. But really, are they going to be great? 
Where will LeBron just be great and the Lakers will look great? Because really, were the Cavs great or was LeBron great and he was a Cav? Well, was the Heat great was Le- or LeBron great? Because, and then the Heat looked great. Because you see, I, I notice a pattern around LeBron. See, before he goes to a team, they're not great. And then while he's on that team, they're great. And then when he leaves that team, they're trash. I mean, the moment he leaves, they're not great anymore. And so even though I don't want to admit this, but I look at it and I go, here's a person for 48 minutes on the floor. They're the greatest, most dominant human being on the planet. And somehow, they change the dynamic for everyone on their team. Everyone on LeBron's team looks better when LeBron's on the team. In fact, you might actually want to pick up those players, except they don't look like the same player when they're not with LeBron. But what happened? They were good for a moment when they were next to LeBron. So I started thinking, what does it take to be great? 48 minutes. Well, for about 10 of those minutes, maybe 12 of those minutes, LeBron is sitting on the bench. Now, one time that wasn't true, last year in the finals against the Celtics for the conference final, where the Celtics should have won and gone to the finals, but LeBron stole it. (laughs) He played all 48 minutes. He simply willed that team to victory. He played all 48 minutes. That's a a physical phenomenon. He's a beast. 48 minutes. That's like running four miles of sprints and having to put a ball in a basket for 48 minutes. But normally he, he only... Plays 37.9 minutes, which is a lot. About 38 minutes a game, LeBron James is on the court. So for 12 minutes, he's on the bench. So how can he be the most dominant player while he's on the bench? And yet somehow he is. And for 38 minutes, he's on the floor. So I'm going, okay, that's when he's great. But do you know, out of those 38 minutes, how many minutes he actually has the ball in his hands? 6.1. He only has the ball in his hands for six minutes. Out of 48 minutes, he's considered the greatest, most dominant player in the game. And what's interesting is that last year, when they lost to the Warriors, he had the ball in his hands, 6.1 minutes. And two years before that, when they lost to the Warriors, he had the ball in his hands, 6.1 minutes. But the year in between, when they actually defeated the Warriors, he had the ball in his hands, 5.1 minutes. The greatest, most dominant player in the world had the ball a whole minute less when he accomplished a greater feat of greatness. What's going on here? See, I think most of us, when we think of greatness, think about those five minutes when the ball's in our hands. And we just keep hoping that when the ball's in our hands, it will actually demonstrate our greatness, but we don't actually factor in that greatness is actually established in those 42 minutes when the ball is not in our hands. And even more that, it's established in all the minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years where you're not even on the court. See, I think a lot of us have a mythology of greatness. Oh, just give me the ball and I'll show you I'm great. And we don't realize that greatness is actually best evidenced when the ball is not in your hands because your greatness elevates everyone else to their greatness. I don't know what it's like, how traumatic it must feel as the greatest player in the world to realize that you cannot win except when the ball is in everyone else's hands. And somehow your greatness has to affect them. So I was thinking about Joseph. Because Joseph's life is a life of greatness. It ends on a high note of greatness. But his life didn't lend itself toward a life of greatness. In fact, in many ways, his life began as a tragedy and it ended as a triumph. And so at the very end of the book of Genesis, it is the end of Joseph's life. And the book of Genesis is odd because the first half of the book of Genesis is the the history of all humanity, and the second half is, oh, and then Joseph. Like, how do you go from everyone to Joseph? But that's how significant Joseph is. The story of all humanity for the writer of Genesis is to get us to the story of Joseph. 
And the moment Joseph's life ends, the book of Genesis ends. Can you imagine living a life so great that a book of the Bible closes when your story closes? And so at the end of his life, in Genesis 50, verse 24 through 26, he says to his brothers, the brothers that we'll discover, if you don't know anything about Joseph, you'll pick it up along the way. He had brothers who betrayed him, brothers who despised him, brothers who sold him into slavery. And, and what we find is that later, instead of holding on to bitterness, Joseph became the vehicle of their salvation. They would have died in a famine, but because of Joseph, they found a future. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And the reason that detail is important is because Joseph was given the highest place of honor in his death that the Egyptian empire could give him. He ended his life as the most important individual in the empire of the Egyptians other than Pharaoh. He lived a life of greatness. But what does it take to be great? What you find over and over again is that individuals who actualize their greatness have a sense of personal destiny. It's almost frustrating because they, they have a sense of destiny that cannot be validated by reality. You just have a sense that you are called, created, destined to accomplish something that seems irrational, it seems beyond you. And that's what happened with Joseph. When Joseph was around 17 years old, he had two dreams that we find were actually given to him by God and in these dreams, he saw his brothers and his father, and he saw that they actually bowed down and worshipped him, or revered him, or honored him. And so Joseph shares his dreams with his brothers and father. That was a bad idea, by the way. I don't care if God gave you that dream. Don't share it with your family. Can you imagine how that would go over? Anybody have brothers, sisters? I had a dream. God showed up. We were all in that dream. What happened? Well, <laughs> we were all in a circle, and I was in the middle. You were like planets and the moon, but I was the sun. And you all bowed down and gave me honor. See, I don't know about you, but that would not go over well in my family. Would not create endearment or affection. I would not be getting my brother and sisters going, that's incredible. I love that. I believe in you. One day I'm going to honor you. I'm going to bow down before you. That's so good to know. And it didn't go well for Joseph. They despised Joseph. They thought Joseph was arrogant and narcissistic and thought too highly of himself. And on top of that, he wore multicolored coats which gave him both style and substance. And I'm okay with that. Because some people wear tassels on their Nikes. And people will hold it against them. Joseph was a dreamer who had a sense of destiny. And here's the curious thing. All your dreams will not become a reality. But if you don't have a dream you will never have a reality worth dreaming about. And there's something odd about people who achieve great things. They actually dream about achieving great things. And if God gives you this dream, keep it to yourself. Let it shape you from the inside out. Let other people begin to identify that dream in you. That's the healthy way of doing it. But I can tell you this. I was 24 years old when I dreamed this place up. I did not live in LA. I did not live in California. I had no tangible evidence I would ever live here, be here, come here, or do this. But I had this dream. I drove through Los Angeles one time at 24, and it overwhelmed me. And I saw Mosaic before she ever existed. I saw you before you ever walked into this building. I had a dream at 24, and I had this sense of destiny, and it drove my life. I 
I remember telling Kim when we were dating, if we get married, we're going to LA. I was talking to a little farm girl from the mountains of North Carolina who did not want to live in a city, who was from the East Coast, that I knew I was going to Los Angeles one day because that dream was inside of me and I believed that there could be a community of faith, a church that would actually inhale the world and exhale the hope that only Jesus could bring to the world. And I, I was out of my mind, but it was a dream that drove my life. And I think that the, the problem sometimes is that when you become a follower of Jesus, you don't use the language of destiny, you use the language of calling. And I'm not that comfortable with the word destiny because it has the word destined in it. Because I think that sometimes we think our destiny is destined. And so all you need to do is just exist because your destiny is waiting for you. But I want you to know your destiny is not waiting for you. Your destiny is waiting for you to create it. There has to be the sense of personal destiny that changes your beliefs and your perspective about life. It drives you forward and it calls you out. And that's the thing. See, I remember when I became a follower of Jesus, they told me, Jesus is calling you. You need to follow him. And so I did. I responded to that call and I gave my life to Jesus. And they said, Jesus is calling you to be baptized. So I did and I got baptized. And later they said, well, you know, Jesus has a call to ministry. I didn't even know what ministry was, but I went and responded to that call. And, and then later they said, you know, Jesus calls people to be missionaries. I didn't know what that was, but I responded to that call because I didn't care what the, the that, what addendum was. I just, if God was calling, I was answering. Because to me, I didn't want a direct call. I didn't need a direct call. If God was just ringing on a payphone on a side street, I'm going to go answer that call. God doesn't have to be calling me. I'm going to answer the call because I want to be wherever God is. I want to live in that intention and that purpose because I know that where God is, that's where life is. But the problem sometimes is that the language of calling is only used for pastors. And so like, oh, you're called. Everybody else is just jello. You don't have a calling. You're uncalled. You did not get the rose on The Bachelor. <laughs> you were unchosen. And so I, I think then the rest of us, we live our lives without intention and without the sense of destiny because we don't understand that we're called. But I want you to understand something. God doesn't have all these different callings. That was just the way Christianity tried to explain the apathy among people who said they were living their lives for Jesus. See, there's only one calling. Jesus says, come follow me. That's the only calling there is. And the moment you hear that call and you choose to follow Jesus, he will lead you into your intention. And if no one's ever told you, you are called by God to live a life that matters, to live a life of significance. You are called by God because he has placed greatness inside of you and he's calling that greatness out of you. When you have that sense of destiny, it gives you an inner belief that gives you a compass that allows you to, to keep walking through your failures and your disappointments. Joseph had a dream, but at 17, his brothers hated him. So instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. And for the next 13 years of his life, he was a slave. I don't know if you ever felt you had a dream from God, but it never became your destiny. You felt like God just let you down. It didn't come through. And I want you to know that, that, that Joseph began his life with a dream, but after that, his life became a nightmare. You have to hold on to it. When, when, I, when I responded to the call to be a pastor, the pastor who was mentoring me in the moment said, now, Erwin, if you can do anything else, you should do it. Because this is a really horrible job, by the way. And it's also an incredible job. And I, he thought that was exclusively to pastors. If you, should do, if you can do anything else, you should do it. But you know what I've discovered? Every calling that comes from God is the hardest calling in the world. See, the calling God has on your life, oh, if you're not ready to step up to it, you should do something else. You should accept a lesser calling. Because if you can do anything else than the calling God has for you, maybe you should do it because it requires less of you. See, you can exist in the status quo. You can embrace mediocrity. You can choose to be average. 
But when you embrace the call of God, all of that goes out the window. When you embrace the call of God, you have to walk away from the status quo. You cannot allow mediocrity to define you. When you accept the call of God, you have accepted a call to greatness and nothing less is good enough. But there has to be not only the sense of destiny, the also, there has to be the self-motivated drive. See, what it takes to be great is an internal drive that is not motivated by anyone else or anything else. It is internal, it is intrinsic, it is a fire that burns inside of you. Have you ever noticed that with world-class athletes? They'll ask them a lot of times, you know, sometimes like one athlete will say something, you know, throw shade on another athlete because does that motivate you? And the athlete who's great will say, I don't need that to be motivated. I'm already motivated. See, if, if, if someone talking smack motivates you, you're just average. If someone else's greatness is what motivates you, you don't understand greatness yet. If you need someone's competition, or if you need someone's backdrop, see, if someone else's success is what's driving you, you're not moving toward greatness. You're being driven by envy, or jealousy, or greed. But that doesn't lead to greatness. So when you move your life toward greatness, you don't need to be motivated by any external factors or circumstances. You have an internal drive that gets you up in the morning because your life matters and you must do something. So God. God isn't just looking for the person who will. He's not just looking for the person who can. He's looking for the person who must. There's a drive inside of you, and you must live this life. And yes, there's a level of madness because you can't settle for less when everyone else can. It is a, a madness that drives you because it's a fire that burns within you. No one else is setting that fire, and no one else will understand why you get up before everyone else and go to bed after everyone else, and why you give just a little bit more than you need to give, and do more than anyone requires of you, and push yourself to be the best you can when so much less would satisfy. That's one of the reasons I love traveling with, with people and, uh, and taking them on our experiences. Aaron and I this time took Kevin Pena and Albert Aquino, two guys we just love, and because I, I, I think sometimes the only way you can help people understand your work ethic your drive is to let them live in the middle of that drive. And, and everywhere we went, I mean, we took three flights to get to Kuala Lumpur. And the day we got to Kuala Lumpur, I was speaking. We went right from the airport to the event after flying 29 hours. And, and each country we would fly to, we would land, and that day would be the event. And every day we'd be driving to the next event, and each time... When everyone was exhausted, we just stepped up a little bit more. And, and I thought it was so funny because it, it, one day told me in every country, well, we never had people who like walked. So what do you mean never people who walked? So there had never been any speakers who like choose to walk the city. So that's insane. Why would you go to a city and not walk the city? Well, you know, they're always, they always get driven to places. They get driven to places because they're not driven. And I remember when we were out one night really late and we were speaking and then we had this event and, and, and I said, what's going on? I said, oh, we're waiting for the cars to come pick you up, take you to your hotel. I'm going, we don't need cars to take us to our hotel. We're going to walk Taipei. I said, but it's hot and muggy. That's all right. It's hot and muggy. We don't melt. We're okay. And, and he said, but it's like 30 minutes away. And I said, oh, it's so close. And, and, and some people were looking at me like, well, we don't really want to walk. I said, you don't have to walk. You can drive. But I'm walking, because I know that you're only 32 and you're exhausted, and, and, uh, and, and you're an old man in spirit, so you need to rest. And, and, and so the pastors and other leaders felt obligated to walk with us, because they couldn't just let me walk the cities by myself. They're just, they're just so hot and clammy and sweaty, and it was so much fun. So much fun. And, and every place we went, we just kept going and going, and they said, do you need to rest? No, I said, if you need to rest, we can leave you at the hotel. I said, but we have things to do. We have a life to live. We have a world to explore. We can rest when we die. And, uh, and, and then in the mornings, I would get up really early and go over to the gym because, because every country had these pork buns <laughs> that were just so amazing. Michelin star pork buns. I did not know maple syrup was a food group. And, uh, 
And so that required working out the pork buns and the dumplings and the noodles. And, and I, I remember one morning I was in, in this gym and, and Albert Aquino came up to me because he came in a little later and he started working out and there's just us two in the place. And, and he came up to me later and goes, hey, are, are you always this intense? I said, what, what, what do you mean? He goes, you know, are you, are you always like this intense? I said, you mean like working out or, or life or what, you know? And he goes, yeah, you know, like, do you always work out this intense? And I said, Albert, this isn't intense. This is just normal. This is just being, you know? And, and, and I realized something that, that we've accepted such a low standard of what we expect from each other, that normal to me looks intense. See, but I want you to say something. I'm not a chill person who learned to be intense. I'm an intense person who learned how to be chill. Because when I was young, I didn't think my life had any meaning. When I, when I was a kid, I, I, I was traumatized because I felt my life was insignificant. I, I lived in fear that my life would never matter. And when I had this life-changing encounter with Jesus, and I realized there is purpose and intention to life. It changed everything for me. No one had to wake me up anymore. You see, before I met Jesus, I couldn't get up in the morning. I didn't have a motivation to even wake up and get out of bed. And I couldn't go to sleep at night because I felt so much distress and sorrow and depression in my life. that I couldn't get up and I couldn't go to sleep. But what happened in my life when I realized I've been created with greatness inside of me, but it's up to me. This greatness isn't going to just come out naturally. I have to live a life with a sense of personal destiny, and I have to have self-motivated drive that says, God, I'm going to do something that matters today. And, and there's some of you here, you're still blaming other people for your lack of greatness. You actually think that life has been unfair to you because other people have more opportunities than you in fact, I, I experience this all the time. I have people who are angry with me, get angry with me because they feel like I, I've had unfair opportunities. Let me tell you something. I worked for years, for decades with urban poor, and I thought all I had to do is give people opportunity, but I learned something really important. That opportunity falls empty when it's given to people without determination. That I can give a person opportunity, but that person has to bring determination. And if you're here, and you do not have determination, if you don't have a personal drive to do something with your life that matters, all the opportunities in the world will come by and will be unused because the opportunities God has given you were not met by your drive and determination. I think you can look back on your life and know that you had opportunities that you missed. And I'm telling you, there's some opportunities available for you right now that if you don't have the drive, you'll never walk through them. What is it that God is laying in front of you that you're just not yet willing to pay the price to step into? I meet so many people who want success, but nobody really wants the sacrifice. You have to have a fire that drives you, a passion that moves you. And when you have the self motivated drive, you have determination and resilience and you face whatever comes, but nothing can hold you back and nothing can hold you down. You just keep getting up and you just push the rubble of your failures aside and you get up and you get up and you get up. And you, don't, you know, it's great to have people championing you. It's great to have inspiration. I hope you're inspired. I, I, it's great to encourage people. I hope you're encouraged, but I want you to know something. Tomorrow's Monday. And it's not my voice that's going to set a fire in your life. It's got to be your inner voice that sets that fire inside. <laughs> Joseph spent 13 years in prison. What motivated him to keep moving forward? Why didn't he give up on his dream? It's because it was a dream God gave him. It wasn't someone else's dream. There was something that happened inside of him and it kept driving him forward until that dream became a reality. But when you see people who achieve greatness, you also see this other aspect of their life because what it takes to be great is not just a sense of personal destiny or self-motivated drive. There has to be a commitment to self-discipline. 
I know this doesn't sound sexy or romantic and no one wants to talk about self-discipline. And, and we live in an environment where we ju- it's just like, hey, you know, I, I want to be free to do whatever I want and, and I just want to enjoy life. And, 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 you know, why, 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 why do you want to just withhold from me all the pleasures? And you know what I want you to understand? Everything you say yes to is you saying no to something else. There is nothing you say yes to that doesn't cost you something. And you need to pay attention to what you're saying yes to because you may actually be saying no to your future. Because people who achieve greatness make a decision to live a life that is self-sacrificing and that has deferred gratification. Just because it brings you pleasure doesn't mean it gives you purpose. If you keep living your life for what you want today, you will not be creating the life you'll want tomorrow. And without trying to over-moralize things, I'm telling you, some of you, you're going to keep repeating your past and wonder where your future went. There was a moment in Joseph's life where he was taken out of prison by a man named Potiphar. He was a powerful Egyptian And he was the servant of Potiphar, so he was still a slave. And one day Potiphar was gone, and Potiphar's wife evidently was, um, I guess she was, you know, what they call old school, like a floozy. And and Joseph was like a really good-looking guy, you know. And and one day she said to Joseph, hey, you know, my husband's gone, and I'm here, and you're here, and you're looking fine. And she put on some Barry White, you know, and... uh, (laughs) Went old school, and um, no, nobody better than Barry White, I'm sorry. And, uh, and then suddenly, he had a choice to make. I don't know, focus on Barry White, it's okay. And, uh, and it would have been so easy for Joseph to decide, you know, God took everything from me, so I'm going to take this for myself. It would have been so easy for him to say, my life is so miserable, why don't I just take for myself? This moment's pleasure. And if he had said yes to her, he would have been saying no to his future. Your every yes has a no. And your every no has a yes. Great athletes, great creators, Learn how to say yes to things that create the future they dream of. What are you saying yes to right now that is stealing from you your future? What are the disciplines you need in your life right now that will shift your life and move you towards your dreams? The dreams God gives you Demand discipline in your life. Greatness doesn't come by accident. Greatness is always on the other side of sacrifice. You cannot be a Mozart without the discipline of studying music. You cannot be a Picasso without the discipline of studying art. You cannot be a LeBron without the discipline of being a great athlete. There is no greatness that can be achieved without self-discipline in your life. I think it's funny, when I was in Brazil, these pastors came up to me and said, we all used to be overweight until you. And now we're all like healthy. And they, they all were bringing out their before and after pictures. And their afters looked like befores. And, uh, but they were making progress. <laughs> but here's the problem. See, pastors didn't have a commitment to discipline. And then they were telling people to be disciplined. And the reality is, if there's anything that matters to you, then you'll be disciplined to get there. But beyond discipline, there's also a meticulous attention to detail. This is something I've noticed about people who achieve greatness. It doesn't surprise me that Colby has a new podcast called Detail. Because he's all about the details. 
In fact, when I listened to him, I thought, man, he's, he's a genius. He really sees the details of everything. In fact, he sees details I didn't even know existed because he pays attention to the game because it mattered to him because he was passionate about it. I used to interview people for jobs. I don't do that anymore. But when I used to interview people, I'd ask them, you know, what's your skill set? What do you bring to the table? Tell me about yourself. And they would always say two things to me. One is, I'm a people person. I thought, that's such a strange thing to say. It's like you're taught to say that. I'm a people person. What other kind of person would you be? Like, I'm an inanimate object person. Like, I'm a bacteria person. So really, there's only one option. Is like, I'm a people person. And you're like, well, what, do you, what about people do you person? What, what, what is it that makes you a people person? And, you know, and they usually don't know. I, well, you know, I, I like people. It's good to know you like people. But there are really no jobs where the requirement is like people. You have to develop people or lead people or mentor people or serve people. You have to do something with people. There has to be a skill that you do with people. And then the other thing they always say is, I'm a visionary. Every 22-year-old I interviewed was, I'm a big picture person. Everybody here, I think, is like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a visionary. I'm a, I'm a dreamer. I'm a big picture person. And I always say, well, what, what, what does that mean to you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a big picture person. Go, yeah, no, elaborate. I'm a visionary. Go, okay, okay, good. Could you be a little more specific? Yeah, I, I'm not good at details. It always gets there. And so I, I work better when I'm like a dreamer, visionary, and I have a team that implements my vision because I'm not good at like details or, or follow through. I said, oh, oh, the job of dreamer, visionary, it's been taken. It's my job. <laughs> and I'm looking for people who are good at details. And here's something I've actually learned. Visionaries are actually committed to details. See, if you're not good at details, you're not a visionary, you're a daydreamer. Because you cannot create a great work and not care about the details. Let me tell you, Michelangelo was a visionary, he cared about the details. Da Vinci, visionary, cared about the details. Frank Lloyd Wright, visionary, who cared about the details. The details actually matter when you're a visionary. It's when you're a daydreamer that you don't care. Because you see, when you love something, the details explode in your brain. Because when you love something, you're passionate about something, you can't stand it when people do not pay attention to the details. I've been married 35 years, let me tell you. One thing you know is that you actually marry a stranger. You do. You think you know each other. You don't. You love each other, but you don't know each other. That's a part of the lifelong journey is knowing each other. But when Kim and I were first married, I would travel a lot, and I'd always bring her a gift to let her know I was thinking about her. I don't know why, but for the first few years, I'd always bring her back T-shirts. I, I don't know what made me think she liked T-shirts. I, I realize now she never wore a single T-shirt I brought back, ever. One year, she had boxes of T-shirts, and she said, we're doing a giveaway, and we gave all the T-shirts away. Because she never liked a single t-shirt I brought back. But I thought, of course, she'll love these t-shirts, right? Missouri, right? You know, it's like, who wouldn't want that? Who would not want that t-shirt, right? Hong Kong. It's like, never. And, and, and so later, I shifted from t-shirts, and I started bringing her clowns. Yes. It's terrifying, isn't it? And I, I started finding clowns all over the world, and I would bring her clowns. And our house was full of clowns. It, it was the most frightening Stephen King experience of our lives. And now Kim did not like clowns. She still does not like clowns, but I kept bringing her clowns. You see, I am a combination of generosity and OCD. So once I'm onto something, I just, more clowns, more clowns, more clowns, more clowns. We need more clowns. I just kept bringing clowns, clowns, clowns. And finally, one day she said, no more clowns. And so I started bringing her lambs. I don't know why. But I, I saw one lamb, and then I realized, oh, there are other lambs in the world. And so I, I started looking. I would look. I would travel a city looking for a lamb to bring home to her. There are countries that don't have lambs, and it would take me so much work. I, I'd come home, and she had lambs everywhere. She doesn't 
like lambs, but I could bring her lambs. And then one year I shifted and I started bringing her bears. Now, bears were easier because the world just seems to have bears everywhere. I bring her big bears and small bears and, 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 and triplet bears and, you know, and just all kinds of bears. And, and our house was full of bears and lambs and clowns. Oh, and then, then the last one was teapots. Now, I thought that was pretty good because I like tea. And, uh, and I thought teapots are kind of cool. And so we were, we were, I think we went to England and I, and I, I saw like a teapot that was a, a, a replica of the Queen's teapot. And Kim loves British culture and she loves like the whole monarchy thing. And so I got her a teapot and somehow that registered my brain. Oh, she likes teapots. So I just started buying her teapots from all over the world. We still have teapots in our house because they're really expensive. Everything else she threw away. And in one year, it just finally occurred to me, I probably should ask her what she likes. <laughs> I don't know why it took me 20 years. <laughs> and what I began to realize is that as you love someone, you pay attention to the details of who they are. You pay attention to the details of what they love and what they hate. You pay attention to the details of the food they like and the food they don't like, of, 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 of the things that irritate them and the things that actually exhilarate them. And you pay attention to the details because when you love something, the details matter. I got to tell you, I've, I've been going through culture shock this week because coming back from Singapore, Singapore is like this brilliantly beautiful city. I, I can't even fully explain it, but it, it, it's like... It, it, it's like nirvana for people with OCD. It's like the perfect city. It's so, there's, there's no garbage anywhere. It's so clean. There are no trash cans. I don't know what they do with their trash. I think they just absorb the trash. <laughs> I, had a, I had a piece of paper one day, and I spent the whole day looking for trash. I just put it in my pocket. I realized, oh, this must be what happens. It's like you have a, a cup, you just put it in your pocket. I, I don't know. <laughs> Because there's no trash anywhere, and it's illegal to chew gum, so there's no gum anywhere, and the streets are immaculate, they're perfect, and all the trees are numbered. The trees are numbered. They have numbers. And the president, when he would drive to the airport, if he saw a tree that wasn't properly manicured or taken care of, he would just send the number to the government, and they'd come right out and fix the tree. It's like a dream. <laughs> and then I came home to L.A. <laughs> I thought, I love you, LA, but you're not looking good. You're kind of like nappy, having a bad hair day. And I, started, and I came over here, and I, and, I, and I honestly, I started looking around going, wow, do we even love properly this thing we call the church? Because we know the church is people, but this building also reflects our feelings about God. And it started affecting me, and I started driving around going, these roads are disastrous. Do we love our city? Or have we just got, have you ever noticed that you can get used to ugly? You ever noticed that? You can get used to nasty. You ever been over one of your friend's apartments? You're like, whoa, dude, you live here? You know. Have you been in that apartment? You know what's bad? When you look at that apartment, you're actually looking inside of the soul of a person. See, if you don't care about the details of your life, you're not paying attention to the details of your soul. And the most important details in your life are the people in your life. How are you taking care of them? How are you treating them? How do you know them? And I even started thinking about giving, how maybe that's why God established tithing. Because we say we love God. That's the big picture. But tithing is like a detail. And when we can't even give 10% of our income to the mission of Jesus, how much do we actually really love Jesus? Because if the details don't matter, I don't think the vision or the dream matters to us either. See, when you take ownership, you move toward excellence. See, I, I want to be that kind of person. 
I want to be the kind of person who's always refining and making everything in my life better and better and better. I, I, I don't want to be satisfied. I want to be a better writer. I want to be a, a better communicator. I want to be a better leader. I want to be a better thinker. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I, I, I want everything in my life to continuously improve. I don't ever want to hit a status quo. I don't ever want to hit a ceiling in my life. I want to always be paying attention to the details because the dream matters too much. And so... Joseph had a dream, and then he started interpreting dreams, and then he paid attention to the details of the dreams. And here's the crazy thing. See, that last dream that Pharaoh had, because there was a Pharaoh who had a dream, and Joseph was brought in to interpret it, and he said there's going to be seven years of plenty, then seven years of famine, and what you need to do is you need to start storing up the abundance during the seven years of, of abundance, and so that you'll have enough for the seven years of famine, and you'll be able to override the dark season of your life. And the Pharaoh says, then you're in charge. And here's the crazy thing. The dreamer was in charge of the details. See, Joseph went from a visionary to an administrator, from the big picture to becoming an economist. And what's amazing is that this is a reminder that when you actually have a dream from God, you begin to pay attention to the details. And just one last thought. Back to this last verse. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and, and take you up out of the land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. Now, I want you to hear what's happening. Joseph says, I'm about to die, but my dream is not going to die. My, my, my life is about to end, but, but there's a future that I'm, I'm helping usher in. And even though Pharaoh wants to embalm me here and bury me here, this is not the end of my story. See, what Joseph was actually saying to them is, is you despised me because you thought my dream was about me. You see, the, the brother they tried to kill, the brother they threw into slavery, became the most powerful man in Egypt. And when the famine came, his family had to run to Egypt, even though they thought the Egyptians would kill them. They had no idea that Joseph was there waiting for them. Joseph, who they wanted to kill, was the beginning of their future. Joseph, whose future they wanted to end, was the one who was protecting their future. And Joseph said, there's, there's something God's still going to do. There's a future that God is still going to create. And I want you to commit to me right now. I want you to swear to me by oath, you will take my bones out of the ground and you will take them into the future that only I can see because you don't have the eyes to see it because you're not a dreamer yet. Because you're settling for less and I want you to move into your greatness. You know what it takes to be great? You have to move from a life that's about you to a life that's about others. Because you see, just like LeBron only holds that ball for six minutes, it's, it's how he affects everyone else those other 42 minutes that really makes him great. When you begin to live your life for others, you begin to understand the meaning of greatness. See, I am absolutely convinced there's greatness inside of you. You will never convince me of anything less. It doesn't matter how many times you failed, how many people you've disappointed. It doesn't matter how many people have ever told you that you're insignificant, that you're not talented enough, you're not gifted enough. It doesn't matter what your past tells you. I'm telling you, you're created by a God who's great and he created you in his image and likeness and there's greatness inside of you. But you have to come to a place in your life where you realize that the greatness that God placed in you was never for you. The greatness that God placed in you was always supposed to be your gift to the world. When you're immature, you're all about living out your dreams, even if it means crushing other people's dreams. When you're immature, art is all about self-expression. When you're immature, it's all about finding your destiny and your intention. But when you finally mature, you realize Greatness is seen best when you're pulling the greatness out of others. Man, live your life, not for your own dreams alone, but live your life to help other people live out their dreams as well. Take your gifts, your talents, 
your passions, your intelligence, take everything that has been placed in you. And instead of hoarding it to yourself to try to make yourself more, so that the world can see you when you have the ball in your hands, live your life in such a way that your life is defined by how you impact other people, how you affect other people, how you bring out the greatness in others. <laughs> Wouldn't it be just the craziest thing if the greatest dreams of our own lives was to unleash the dreams of other lives? That's who I want us to be. I want us to do what it takes to be great. I want us to live the kind of life where when we come to the end of our lives, we say, you know, I'm not finished yet because my life was never about me. It was always about you. So just take my bones up. Take my bones up because my bones are never going down. You take my bones up because there's a future still to be created. And by the way, that's exactly what Jesus did. I don't know if you know this, but when God stepped into human history, he didn't need to do that. He was already great. God didn't have to take on flesh and blood to prove he was awesome. He was already awesome. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't do that for himself. He did it for you and for me. See, he didn't need to do anything to be great. He was already great. When Jesus died on the cross, he did the greatest thing that could ever be done. In that moment of sacrifice, he gave up his greatness so that your greatness could be awakened. See, you want to know who Jesus is? When you get on the court on his team, he makes you look great because he pulls out the greatness in you and you finally become the person you were created to be. When Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't do that for him. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for you. He did it for you. Because Jesus conquered death, not because God needed death conquered, but because we needed death conquered. I want you to know something. There's some of you here right now, you're haunted by an emptiness. You're haunted by the realization that there's something inside of you you can't seem to access, that there's a greatness inside of you, and you sense it, you feel it, you long for it. You have to believe. But you're wondering why you can't get to it. It seems lost in the abyss of your soul. And I want you to know it's because the greatness in you can only be accessed by the God who placed it in you. And right now, I just want to invite you to cross that line of faith. Just take that step of faith and courage and place your life in the hands of the God who loves you. And give yourself to Jesus so he can give himself to you. And I want to lead you in a prayer right now where you allow the God who is great to forgive you of all your past and set you free to live your future. Because if you could have just made the decision 10 years ago that would have changed your life today, would you go back in time to change your decision? If you could go back 20 years ago and make a decision that would make your life the life of your dreams, would you go back and make that decision? I want you to live in this moment right now and look 20 years ahead. Because in 20 years, you're going to look back to this moment and say, thank God, 20 years ago, I chose Jesus. For some of you right now, you need to go five years into the future and look back to this moment and say, five years ago on that night at Mosaic, I made the decision that changed my life and ushered in a new future. You, some of you are going to look back 30 years from now and you're your family is going to ask you what changed your life and you're going to look back to this moment and say 30 years ago I was in a room and I decided enough was enough. No more status quo. No more apathy. No more mediocrity. I was going to live up to the greatness that God placed in me and it changed everything. I want this to be the moment that your future is defined by. And I want you to bow your heads with me just right now and close your eyes. And if you're here right now and you're ready to give your life to Jesus. You're ready to cross that line of faith. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me right now. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, just tell him. Jesus, I give you my life. If this is your prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. If this is your prayer, if in this moment you've made that defining decision to give your life to Jesus, I want to pray for you. I want to nail this decision down 
that you've crossed that line of faith, that you belong to Jesus. If you just prayed this prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. I want you to hold up your hand right now. I want you right now without shame, without embarrassment, without hesitation. Right now, just hold up your hand high and say, yes, this is my moment. I crossed the line of faith and said, Jesus, I give you my life right now. Beautiful. Anyone else right now? Just hold your hand up high. I want to see you. Beautiful. Anyone else? Beautiful. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life. Wonderful. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life right now. This is your moment. Jesus, I give you my life. Anyone else? I thank you, Father, for all these women and men who in this moment have crossed the line of faith and given their life to you. I pray this would be the beginning of new things for them, that you would just wrap them up in your love and let them know they belong to you. I pray, God, that this would be the defining moment that shapes their future, that they would know that you'll never leave them or abandon them, that they belong to you. We thank you, Father. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you one more thing. Some of you are here and you believe in Jesus. Some of you are here and you've given your life to Jesus, but you've been drowning in mediocrity. You've accepted the status quo. You've not taken a hold of your greatness. And today you're making a decision. I'm going to do what it takes to be great. I'm done being average. I'm done with mediocrity. I'm done with the status quo. I'm ready to make the decisions for God to unlock that greatness in me. And what I want you to do, if that's you, I want to pray for you, but I want you to find the courage to stand and say, yes, that's me. Today is my defining moment. This is my defining moment. I'm going to step out of the status quo. I'm going to step out of my apathy. I'm going to step out of mediocrity. I'm going to step into the greatness God has for me. I'm going to step into my intention. I'm going to make this the moment where my life changes on an access. A new future is mine. Just stand right now. I want to pray for you if that's you. Right now, if that's you, I just want you to stand. I want you to stand in your courage. I want you to stand in God's strength. I want you to stand in the knowledge that God has placed greatness in you. And now he's waiting to pull it out of you. Beautiful. I thank you, Father, for these women and men who have stood in this moment and said, yes, I believe you place greatness in me. And I'm going to do what it takes to be great, to live a life that honors you that reflects you. No compromise, no status quo, no mediocrity. I'm giving you the best, Jesus. I'm giving you my best. I'm giving you my everything. We thank you, Father. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Can we just thank God for everyone? Let's all stand together. Come on, stand with me. Let's just thank God for what he's doing in our hearts and lives right now. What a beautiful message from Pastor Irwin. Thank you so much, sir, for just reminding us of who we truly can be. Man, it's gonna be a message I'm gonna reflect on all week. And I know there are so many of you today that that message like got deep into your soul. And, and if you're here today and, and you made a decision to trust Jesus with your life, we first just wanna say welcome. We wanna just congratulate you, wanna give you a big hug because this may be the most important decision that you ever make with your life. And if that was you when you made that choice, can you let us know by grabbing your phone and texting the word DECIDED to 71711. And when you do that, we'll have somebody on our team that will follow up with you because we want to help you as you begin walking with Jesus. So go ahead and tech, grab your phone and text DECIDED to 71711 and we're going to give you tools to help you uh, as you begin your relationship with Christ. We hope you had an amazing day. We love you so much, Mosaic, and we will see you next week.